uh, March and April. Here you get the sunshine. Ah. I want that view. Okay. Uh, Ken Beresford, shaking daddy O. How's the uh, it, how's the traffic on Capilano Road? It's starting to build up again. Yeah, the suspension uh, bridge is open. Yeah, all the locals think, oh, that, we have yeah, we haven't been to Capilano in years. Let's go. It's how much? Yeah, I was quite shocked when I realized how much it had gone up. I think it's 55 bucks. I know. Depends on when you go. You, after five o'clock, they drop the price. <laughs> I think the last time I went, it was 12 bucks. Oh, so you haven't been since the 1890s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's when it opened. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it opened in 1889, but the price went to 12 about five years later. <laughs> Oh, right. Yeah, yeah that, it, it's in the category of uh, please burn your money right here. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. And uh, I know uh, our guest speaker, Sandy, is there hiding somewhere. I'm here. Hi, how are you? Hi, very good. We're just going to wait another couple of minutes until... Uh, our, uh, our usual co-host, Matthew, is uh, doing this uh, remotely today. He's on the road for a few minutes, but uh, he's uh, adding people in, so that's good. How is Trish today? She is good. She's right here. Let's have a look. Love to doing? see her. Yeah. Oh, I don't know if you can see her with the... Hi, Trish. How are you? How lovely to see you. Trying to wave oh, at the camera. There. Oh, wait, wait. Now that the the iPad's blocking her view of of uh, Donald Trump, and she usually goes. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> She's my girl. <laughs> you didn't get a chance to see last night's uh, Seth Meyers with uh, the closer look. It's absolutely priceless. He also slams John Bolton for being one of those people that. Uh, stand back and watch this guy in horror, but do nothing until they can run away and then write a book and make money. <laughs> yeah. Well, it'll be curious to see how history treats this gentleman. I don't think oh, it will be kind. Oh, poorly, poorly. <laughs> yeah. every, every 10 Americans I've seen for the last uh, several summers, eight of them all go, oh, he's an embarrassment. We can't wait to get him out of there. Yeah. <clears throat> well, let's hope they all vote in those kind of numbers. Well, they're gonna, the yeah. voting day is gonna be quite a uh, long lineups and they really should try to do the voting over two days. I know they won't, but they should because yeah. there's no end to people that uh, now the, the Republicans are playing uh, fear mongering with the, oh, you don't, don't do a mail-in ballot. Oh, that's crooked, that's crooked, yeah. Meanwhile, they vote that way themselves, but it's yeah. not good for the public. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So apparently Matthew isn't, uh, we're not going to see Matthew. So uh, my understanding is this is already being recorded. So we'll just wait one more minute. Uh, did uh, Hardy, did you say you've got sunshine over there in Lions Bay? Here, take a look. That's the sun above the clouds. Uh, it's the sun oh, above wonderful. the clouds. Is that your trumpet? Can you play? Yes, I was roped into it for the uh, seven o'clock festivities in Lions Bay. But the, I'm pretty well blowing all myself now. The enthusiasm has declined somewhat. Yes, it depends on the day of the week, I noticed. 
<laughs> whether it's raining or not. The Royal yeah. Columbian Hospital, that I can hear the honking horn, the honky horns and sirens and people screaming. And <laughs> Also, uh, my neighborhood, you know, two, three weeks ago, I was tipping the guests, people got back to work, some some of them, or many of them. Yeah, yeah. Around that time. All right, I should, uh, I should get myself a checkered flag so that people who are trying to speed up the tape here, they can know when we're starting and finishing. But, uh, all right, here we go. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Jeff, and uh, this is the uh, 10th CTGA Zoom meeting. And uh, we're um, reminding you that uh, we now have a YouTube channel. Uh, it's the CTGA's own, and uh, we, would, uh, we, need a, we need to apparently get 100 subscribers, and we're short about 85 at the moment. So uh, if you go to youtube.com and look for CTGA of BC Media, uh, you might need to uh, open an account. So you just need an email address, or uh, you, uh, and then maybe create your own password. You may or may not. It depends whether your name might already be in the system um, and such. The uh, coach vi coach safety videos that we did are there, and also uh, some of the last several of the um, uh, CTJ Zoom meetings with our guests are there as well. Now, uh, I went back to Cantrail Coach uh, a week or so ago, and I created some additional videos that are on coach safety. And uh, even if you saw the first set uh, and you're still trying to get it straight in your head, if this happened to me, what, what is it I do again? You can watch the first videos again, or when the second set of videos show up, even though some of them are the same, still can still watch them anyways and uh you know that repetition of watching it a couple times uh two different days that i did it uh the odd time i might have made a a, a slip of the tongue with a word error or, or something but it uh, also on the second set of coach safety videos in the uh, event that for some reason you needed to either start the coach or stop it uh a scenario let's say where you're all in a restaurant and the, the driver is suddenly dealing with something that he just can't get out to the coach for. He has to take a phone call or maybe he's doing whatever. So he says, here, here's the key. Go to the bus, unlock the door, open the door, get in and start it. You'll know how to start it. Uh, you know, and that way you can get the people on the bus, get the air conditioning running, and you know, you'll speed up the process a little bit. So um, that's a new video over and above different from the uh, first set that I did. Okay. Let's uh, welcome uh, our uh, first time. It, it's only just because I was trying to get other female speakers previously, but they weren't available. So our first female guest speaker is today, Sandy James. And uh, Sandy, let's get you to say hello. Hi, well, I'm so honored to be one of the first female speakers. And uh, tell us you're originally from uh, back east. Where back east? Well, I'm actually from the Middle East, from uh, the Ottawa Valley. Um, my family has farmed for three generations on a Hereford farm just outside of Ottawa. Oh, fantastic. And uh, uh, before you came west, uh, by the way, I'll just remind everyone else, except for Jeff and Sandy, uh, to uh, turn your uh, microphones off. I don't have that control. Uh, uh, Matthew, Matthew is not at his home base right now. He's doing this remotely. But Sandy, how did you come to... Uh, uh, going down, down to South Africa, digging some ditches. I'm sure people will want oh, to hear that story. Uh, I actually was in West Africa. West Africa. And, uh, yeah, and I actually have a funny story about that. There was a government program uh, it, when I was, uh, it, it, in the old days, they didn't have a gap year. You went to grade 13. And so yep. I didn't want to do grade 13. I thought digging wells in Africa would be ever so much better. But um, I, I worked in Senegal and in Gambia. Uh, and I actually, I actually have seen the blue Touaregs coming out across the desert with their camel trains in the old days. And they would stop and ask you what country they were, you were in, in the desert. Yeah. And uh, so it was, it was a remarkably good thing to do to teach you, that you how great Canada is and how important it is to have a home and also to really value going back to school. <laughs> <laughs> So how long did you spend there? And what was the part about digging the ditches? Uh, I dug wells. I dug, dug wells well. in the 
yeah, we were in teams of Canadians and uh, we were half, half French, half English, and I was in a French country, so I got to learn to speak French with a Quebec accent. Uh, and we, we dug wells and uh, in the jungle, we, we, uh, we, we did similar programs or uh, we built a house for people to have their babies in, which was culturally really inappropriate because their people had have their babies quite happily in their houses. But that was the kind of thing we did in those days. Wow. And so after a little bit of time, you came mm -hmm. back to Canada and ended up in Edmonton? Uh, yeah, I, I went back to university and um, I, I was in university at Carleton University doing urban economics. And I heard that the streets were paved with gold in Edmonton. And so I went out for a summer job. I immediately got one and uh, I worked for Shell Canada and I handled about $2 million of scrip a day, which was what they were making in those days. And um, I eventually went back to university in, in Ottawa and came back and worked in Edmonton and finished, as, finished my first degree as a visiting student. And I, I wrote a thesis on Fort McMurray, the history of Fort McMurray. Wow, which of course has been in the news a lot uh, the last few years with the fires and unfortunately earlier this year with the floods. Right, and it, what's interesting about Fort McMurray, Jeff, is that originally it was just a fur trapping, uh, fur, fur out, outpost. And in those days, the, the, the First Nations had, um, the indigenous trails were in the Muskeg that went straight across uh, <coughs> Peter Pondulet <coughs> and kind of connected into the, the great waterway <coughs> system. Those were all still existing. You know, they, those would have been four or 500 years old. Wow. And then uh, what happened? You somehow managed to take a trip to Vancouver. Well, you know, it's really cold in Edmonton in winter. And so um, I got on a train, which was the cheapest way to travel in those days. And I came across to um, Vancouver wearing a big down jacket. And I got off the train. Of course, the first thing anybody does is you go. I went to Stanley Park. And Jeff, there were people with shorts. It was December. People were in shorts in Stanley Park. And there were birds. like, And they... They, they were defecating everywhere, but there were like there were Canada geese. There were still birds, and everybody, everything looked so shiny and so so clean, and the people were so nice. And I just decided that I couldn't believe this was in Canada, and I really had to find a way to move here. So I went to do a graduate degree, and I chose UBC as my 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 university to do a graduate degree in city planning. Wow, fantastic. And uh, fell in love with the place, stayed. Uh, and uh, how did you, what was it you were doing before you got to uh, work for the city of Vancouver for a number of years? Well, I was director of development for Old Strathcona Foundation, which was a heritage area that was in, in, in Edmonton. It's on White Avenue in that part of the city. And I also um, worked as a, for the deputy minister of transportation in Alberta. So I've been to every almost every city in Alberta. So it's quite exciting. And I wrote the um, orders and council for head smashed in buff Buffalo jump in well, Alberta. Many, as, many of us have been there. That's um, yeah, isn't, isn't a great place to get a Rockies trip where it extends south of Calgary. That's a fabulous museum. Yeah, and, and I'm unbelievable that something like that is still in the landscape. Uh, and, and hadn't been interpreted. And I also wrote the um, order and council for Medelta, the Medelta Potteries okay. in Southern Alberta. So and I had a real interest and passion in heritage and planning. And when I go to a city and I'm supposed to meet with city staff, I have a secret. I always go out with a tour guide first. And that way I find out a whole bunch more information. Um, I was in New York City right before the pandemic and I went out with context um, historical tours and they actually had a guy with a doctorate that was talking about where uh, the original part of New York was in, in the meatpacking district and my secret is that if I use tour guides and, and hear and learn from them then when I go in to talk to the city I really I have a bit more idea of what I'm talking about so yeah. it's been invaluable to me. Yeah, you told me, uh, we spoke a few days ago, you, 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 you take tour, uh, bus tours or walking tours, anything you can. Absolutely. It's the and, one way to learn. Yeah, fantastic. Um, and, yeah. I uh, think Chicago's really good at that. They do the Frank Lloyd Wright tours all through the uh, different subdivisions that Frank Lloyd, Frank Lloyd Wright traveled in. And there's, yeah, it, it's a great opportunity just to learn. Wow. So, so, so thank so, you very much for everything you guys do because it's so important. And you know, when you meet people from Vancouver that have taken a tour, they're always happy. 
So I know you're doing a good job. Yes. Yes, uh, the uh, touring public is different from the general public, so to speak. Uh, people who yeah. work in a restaurant or a, or a, or a uh, you know somewhere department store the you know or on transit it's it's just whole different but when they get on a tour bus especially because they paid for a tour to see things yes they're usually happy to have you uh, say hello and talk with them and point out this point out that and away you go you know and then you know make a few stops and so on uh, so again how did you and uh, you worked for Mr John Blatherwick when you did, was he the first I guy did. you worked with? former health oh, oh. Uh, director for the city of Vancouver years ago. Yeah, when I graduated, I graduated from my master's degree in the early 80s. And you remember that was the time that mortgages went up to 14% and nobody had money and nobody was employed. So I felt really blessed. Um, planning is the same as epidemiology, which is really the study of disease. And uh, so I was lucky enough to work as the, as the health planner for John Blatherwick. And so we set up um, the services for AIDS in the mid 1980s in Vancouver. And um, I also worked on the, the, the single rooming occupant housing ev evictions. People may remember that um, there was a fellow named Olaf Solheim that uh, lived for 42 years in the Patricia Hotel and was evicted and died about a week later. And I also did work on the Expo um, uh, 86, <laughs> the Expo 86 um, World's Fair, just in terms of the health and planning side of that for the city. So it was a great um, segue to put the intersection of health with city planning when I moved into the more um, conventional career. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Olaf, for those who don't remember, Olaf, the older gentleman who lived at the Patricia, uh, he, um, it was kind of a famous thing that the media picked up on the fact that some of the hotels in the city, such as hotels like the Patricia on Hastings, not too far, just east of Maine, uh, were evicting people so they could renovate and they were hoping to cash in on, you know, making lots of money during the time uh, the expo was on for five and a half months or so, which is what did happen. And uh, so, yeah, he died about a week later after being evicted, right? Yeah. Right. And I think that that's one of the themes about planning in the city that um, we've also had, we've always had a real social conscience and a passion about social conscious in, in Vancouver. And we actually wrote a report um, to council and, and the, the theme of the report was, can somebody die from being evicted of a broken heart? Now where else in Canada or in North America would you see a report written by that? And John Blatherwick uh, came out and said, you know, we can't say whether it was, but these are the contributing factors. And so, you know, a lot of interesting work has happened in Vancouver in the sense that we've taken mental and physical health and well-being um, as part of our city city policy and work, and we've been way ahead of many cities in North America with that. Yeah, and then uh, so uh, the, tell, explain as, as for some of us who may not be quite clear, the city planning department uh, they're supposed to look at what when a particular building is being set up and what's going to happen with it, or a neighborhood, or Tell us more about the planning department. We do hear it mentioned quite a lot. Right, and that's a really good question. And, and it, really, it really has changed. Um, city planning is really about taking a look at the city and it, it's about organization and the social aspects of it and how to create a city for the policies that you want. In Vancouver, we're looking at accessibility, everybody being able to have access to being able to get to and from work easily. And we're also looking at housing we're looking at parks, places to recreate, and, and just how you want the city to be. So it's a strange kind of catch-all profession because it's not really an architect. It's not really a designer. But the best way I can describe it is it's a closet where you've got a whole bunch of hangers, and some of them are legal, and some of them are social, and some of them are professional. So in, in terms of what you asked, everything is done in the planning department. In the old days, um, before the city developed 311 which is that phone line that they use you could pick up a phone and call anybody at the city and i used to get about 50 calls a day and that was really important to me because it gives you a real understanding of what's going on but each planner would be attached either to a planning program or we would have specific work or we'd be looking at policy and anything that we write goes to council for approval and at that point that's where the public come out to speak about um, 
what they, how, how they would like to see it, but normally the public is involved before that as well. Huh. So uh, speaking of the architects, they work separately? Um, the architects are just, architects just build buildings. I, 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 apologies to any tour guide who's an architect, but, but their job is building the building. So the planning, the planning, a planner does the specs. Often there are architects that are also planners that because they have that expertise will help in the design and how you place a building, but they're much more site specific and planners will look at entire areas. Hmm. Hmm. All right. And your, uh, when you first started in the planning department, what were you working on and what did you eventually lead to? Cause I think you did something to do with some walking and biking aspects of, uh, our livable city. Right. right. And, you know, again, that's one of the, the, the real themes from the city that most of the planning work that's come out has all been from community activism. You know, we were talking about one of the things that makes Vancouver different than any other city in North America is that we do not have a highway downtown. There's no connection. Mm -hmm. There's no way to go. You hit the city boundary, you're going 50K. And that really was due to the incredible folks in Strathcona and Chinatown, who um, are they're not only pioneers, but they are the people that made Canada. This is the first neighborhood that came out of the folks that built the railway. That was the area that they were in. And they were the only ones that stood up and said, you know, this is really not a good idea. And they were able to stop it. So that's, it, it's that kind of activism that really impacted my work. So uh, there was a group of people in the 90s that got together and they called themselves the Urban Landscape Task Force. They were a group of citizens. Uh, one of them includes Maura Quayle, who's now um, one of the deans at UBC. And they just saw that as the city was developing, and we went into this curve when uh, Mr. Campbell was mayor, where people started getting very interested in doing higher form development here. And they wanted to do a connection uh, to have a 10, a, a 10 minute bike ride or 20 minute walk to have these what they call greenways, they're really green streets that eat, that would have sidewalks, they'd have public art, they'd have access to washrooms, they would have um, great wayfinding and benches, and they wanted to have a series of them, 120 kilometers across the city. So that was the work that I was doing. But well, when you, met, uh, uh, you mentioned uh, Campbell, there were three Campbells in Vancouver's history. Right. Oh, Tom, that's right. Tom, Tom Campbell, uh, Gordon Campbell, and... Uh, yeah. Da Vinci Campbell. Yeah, yeah there, there's, there's Tom, Cam Wrecking Ball Tom Campbell, who remember he has the picture of himself on the Wrecking Ball. And then there's, it was Mr. Campbell, Gordon Campbell is the one that I, I work quite closely with. And he read everything. He, he, um, he read everything. So he was very effective in the kind of work he did, no matter what your politics. And so we had very strong leadership and, and Mr. Harcourt was the same. And Mike, Mike Harcourt also knew everybody at City Hall. So it was, it was like being in a big family, but you knew you were there 24 seven. And so you always had to have good deportment anywhere you were because someone would find out <laughs> if you hadn't. Yeah, we're, we're, uh, just going back for a moment to that uh, phone line that they have now, the uh, 311 phone number. Uh, so right. I remember the days when you could find out the, who was in charge of a department and get their almost direct line and probably get right through to them and say, hey, how come that happened? So with 311, uh, the operator takes everything down and sends you an email. Is that, that how people are notified that someone wants to know something about something? Yeah, like 311 is supposed to be like the 911 of City Hall. But because, you're, because of the work you do, I'm going to give you a trade secret. There's something online. You can just Google Quick Find Vancouver. Quick mm -hmm. Find Vancouver. And that's actually the, the, the back door into finding out who does what at City Hall. Then you put in, it says subject, you can put in, you know, uh, uh, garbage cans, and it will give you the contact of who the person is. And sometimes it even gives you the back door of the real phone number. But again, this, this is the kind of change that's happened in the last 15, uh, 15 to 20 years where there's less accessibility and all of a sudden the city has become quite separate from its uh, really its original intent, which is really to listen to uh, the public and, and respond to what the public is saying. And this will change again, where we'll become much more accessible. It's just where we are. And remember, Vancouver is really a city of protest. And I think you were involved in Habitat. In I, uh, 
I started working my first uh, full year in doing tours was 1976. And that's the year at the Habitat Conference uh, held mostly at Jericho Beach. Uh, Well, actually some of the meetings were downtown, but the focus was on Jericho Beach, the World Habitat Forum. Um, Alan Clapp, if you ever read up on Alan yes. Clapp, he's come, his name has come up on a couple of our Zoom talks here because he was one of the movers and shakers for Granville Island, both, both um, before, during, and after the island. He's passed on now. But uh, Alan, yeah. Alan did yeah. everything. He did yeah. everything. But, but that's something to really remember that, you know, we had a big protest uh, for the Black Lives Matter. We closed, the city closed downtown. There were 7,000 people out. And Vancouver just accepts that. It's really part of what makes us who we are. And even if you look back at the history of Vancouver, um, I I have a chapter in this book that was published in Australia. And I was saying to you earlier that um, we didn't have a race separation. We had a class separation in Vancouver. Nobody ever left the downtown because of race. It was a class thing. And it's interesting, um, when when I did my chapter in the book, uh, one of the things I wrote to the editor is that we had 120 miles, they work in miles in Australia, of, um, of streetcar in the 1920s. And the editor kept saying, well, that can't be possible. And I said, yeah, we did. You could go out to Steveston, you could go out to New Westminster on the streetcar. So what that meant is that no matter what you did as a job, you, could, you had two things. You had accessibility, you could get on that streetcar for a certain price, and you could get a lot. So everybody had access to housing. And I think that really, um, you know, when you're talking about the city and the city growth, we have such an attachment to the single family home here. And we have such an attachment to ownership and access. And that really is, is so embedded from those early streetcars where we had that connection across the region. Yeah, and uh, something you said a few minutes ago about the housing, uh, what, you know, they were working on housing for a long time. And then what stopped? What changed to the point now where we hear all the time there needs to be more housing? I, 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 I would normally ask you more so, you, so I knew exactly what you mean. But I think what you mean is why, why do we need to have more housing? Well, I know why we need more housing. We have more people right. moving here and uh, yep. they, they, there, there's a lot of uh, either uh, young people moving with no, they don't have a partner, they don't have any children, right. or they, they come out here. I know my yeah. mom came back to Vancouver, we left temporarily, and uh, it was just her and myself, and we needed, we you know, in the West End in the 60s and 70s, there were plenty of places you could rent for reasonable and so on, and now you hear that again, that we still need reasonable rent, and of course, we know areas right now like Metrotown and Burnaby are kicking out, you know, tearing down a lot of the old three-story walk-ups and new condos are going in. But I remember hearing somebody a few years ago in the media saying that the housing, uh, was it the province and federal government and the city all stopped at the same time providing and making sure there was affordable housing? Right, right. Well, you, you've picked up a couple of points. And the first is that if you take a look at Vancouver itself, there's only so much land. It's all kind of contained. It's surrounded by water and you've got the boundary with Burnaby. So you've only got a certain amount of land, land surface. And I remember 30 years ago, people say, well, everything is zoned. Everything is built that could be built. Well, yeah, but just like in Rome or any other place, you can always rezone, you can always do more. But I remember in, um, early 80s when I came out here to go to university and I was in Alberta. And in Alberta, I had uh, a little penthouse on top of a a three story walk up and it had uh, its own furnace and I paid $550 for that. It was was lovely, but that was the price in Edmonton even at the height of the boom. I come out here and that, I couldn't find anything under $1,000, nothing. Mm -hmm. And that would have been what, 40 years ago. And I mean, I was just crying trying to find a place. And finally, I found a, a lovely three-story walk-up with this uh, a, one, a wonderful lady that was the owner and landlord. But um, affordability has always been an issue here because people want to live here. And what's happened in the last 30 years is that, and, and this is the prices of 
of what it costs to rent really have not gone up. But what has happened is that the salaries have not kept pace. Mm. We, we are not a technological city. We don't have a head offices for corporations here. We, we just don't have that. Um, it's still seen as, it's, it's not really seen, it's a place it where um, you have offices for businesses and for tech, but we don't have like Amazon corporate headquarters that is bringing a whole bunch of people in that, that have money. And so it's, it's, been, it's been an issue because we've seen that hollowing out um, in how um, affordability works. But for, for the tour guides, um, I also wanted to let you know when the Sylvia used to be owned by that family, there was one family that owned it forever. They had um, two little rooms right above the entrance that they kept for students and they were $18 a night. Oh. If, you were going to, if you were going to the University of British Columbia and you were a student, they would rent these two little tiny rooms out. And you know, it's interesting because now that, that's always the first hotel I tell people to stay in just because of that great kindness. Uh, mm -hmm. that they offered when you were trying to find a place to rent. But in answer to your question, um, pe people look at it two ways in terms of um, like, what do you do with housing? And you can build more housing and you keep building. This is the developer. You can build, build more and finally you'll get enough. But as we know, we've built more, but what we've built is not what uh, people with an average salary or a Vancouverite can afford. We don't make 140, 160,000. We just don't, we just don't. And so it, 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 that feeds into the developer idea. They're only, um, the market only really has five or six major developers in Vancouver. We don't have the mom and pop that are, are building buildings. It's five or six developers that control it. So the second question is, well, if, if that's not working and then work by Andy Yan, who's the Duke of Data at Simon Fraser University is showing that um, we, he, he figures that, he knows for sure that 10% of the housing in Vancouver is, is foreign owned. And that was very contentious at the time, but it's also suggesting that it wasn't being used full time. And so we've, and, and we've also seen that with the VRBOs, right? That, that they may have been taking some out of the market, but the truth is we're not building that middle band. And it's really a simple thing to solve, but, it, but to solve it needs really big sticks. And that's, that's trying to create it. Um, and you're right, the federal government did have a program on to that, ended in the 80s, early 90s, that helped with housing. But it's talking about coming back and looking more at the cooperative housing model or a co-share model of how to um, get housing to, uh, to, to, to redevelop in the city. The uh, social housing that we have in almost every neighborhood, uh, I know there's one just out my window here, uh, 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 um, I, I point that out to a lot of visiting uh, tourists and they're like, really, that's a social housing building. Yeah, and they're in every neighborhood there. In fact, there may be two or three. Do, do we know how that uh, came out? So, so at Campbell and uh, Avenue and um, Hastings Street was the Ray Muir projects, I think it was called, and that, that was kind of an idea at the time. Uh, but uh, how did it come about that the, the city hall got the idea or who got the idea? Why don't we put social housing in every neighborhood and that way it's not all one area that's considered later a poor area or a slum area. Do you know how that came about? Yeah, you know, and those Rainier projects that we're talking about, uh, those were part of what, dis what, uh, what came in after they started doing the clearances in Strathcona, right? There were this whole old historic neighbors, neighborhoods that were taken out to build that. But in terms of the city, um, it, the 60s, the 70s, 80s, and 90s are really progressive for the city uh, in terms of planning. One of the things they said is if you want to build 100 units in Vancouver, 10% of that has to be for social housing. And what wow. social housing means is housing for um, either uh, senior citizens, uh, folks with any disabilities, or people, that, um, uh, uh, people with, it, with, it, with income challenges. But uh, Jeff, I do exactly what you do. And one of the buildings I point at is I look at the the Boza development at the, at the foot of False Creek. And I always try to get people to tell me which is the social housing building. Um, so, uh, and, and people normally can't, can't tell, and I'll give them the hint, look for the laundry, because anybody that's a mom is gonna be hanging laundry out on the balcony to dry. If you're a mom, you're doing that because it smells so much better. But you know, um, there was at one time this idea of just making the housing, like social housing, and that was kind of a 70 and 80s thing. 
And then the idea of putting a couple of units in each building. Um, as we go on to more co-op, uh, and remember most of the housing around Falls Creek is in that co-op model where it's owned by CMHC or it's owned by the city and it's on a 30 or 50 year lease and then you buy a share. And, every, and so the people that will be, that'll be in the co-op range from architects that have built some of the major buildings in Vancouver to single moms with three kids. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, I'm going to get uh, any of the members who are uh, thinking that questions that they would like to ask Sandy. Uh, if you want to either speak up in a moment or so or right now or, or uh, do it on the chat and then I'll ask her that. Uh, can, in, uh, in 2011, uh, the, you told me the other day in 2011 how to make the cities walkable. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Can you tell me a bit more? You, you, you told me the other day that uh, in 2011 is when- Oh, right. Yeah, I ran, a, I ran a major conference here called Walk 21. That was a big international conference. And um, we had people come from all over the world here. And everybody talks about how, how walkable the city feels. And again, it, for me, it really comes back to this idea of protest that we always, um, you know, you could, even when I came here in the 70s, if you went by a construction site, somebody had scrawled, you know, developer scum on the side of a hoarding. You didn't see that anywhere across Canada. I was, I was shocked. I had never seen that kind of um, outrage. But what I've noticed here is that the accessibility of being able to walk places has always been really, really important to the city. And so, yeah, we ran a very major conference here and uh, everybody absolutely absolutely loved it and many people stayed on just to learn more. Hmm. Wow, fantastic. Uh, and let's, uh, oh, it, apparently you stood right in front of uh, bulldozers oh. when the townhouse was threatened in 1982. Yeah, yeah. There, you know, it was interesting. It, it, I, I guess most folks that have been down here will remember what False Creek used to look like. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was pretty grubby, but it was very cool if you're into industrial things but it was also all fenced off. And at that time, uh, the roundhouse, which is not the original roundhouse because that was in New Westminster and they used to turn the drain around, but the, the roundhouse that came here uh, was located down there and it was a full one. Now that it was a full horseshoe, now there's yeah. only half a horseshoe, but at that time it was gonna be demolished um, and it was by the British Columbia Building Corporation, uh, which I, just, I think is called Pavco now, Pavilion yeah. Corporation. and um, a group of architects and one planner, that was me, stood in front of the, they, we were students. We took the day out from UBC and came out and, and stood in front of the bulldozer. And I was saying to Jeff, it's on YouTube. And you can tell me because all architects, even then when you're a student, they wear black. I'm the one person wearing yellow. And <laughs> we stood in front of the bulldozer and we were arrested by the police, the CPER police, and taken to, um, Mr. Alvin Nayrod's office, and I was taken in as a ringleader, and I was told by Mr. Nayrod I would never work in the city again. <laughs> <laughs> what did he know? <laughs> he must have had his blacklist out. Yeah, yeah. He was uh, Albert. There's a, a little uh, laneway name for him just near Canby and Pacific Boulevard, and he was one of the movers and shakers of getting BC Place uh, physically constructed. Yes, uh, he was. There, black in his honor just in the main entranceway there uh, in between gates A and gate B at uh, BC Play Stadium there. So, um, uh, and, and the, roundhouse, the roundhouse was in the way at that time of, of that plan. So we actually did get a court injunction and that stopped the, the, the deconstruction of it, which really, really upset Mr. Nayra, but that was the reason we were standing in front of the bulldozer was just waiting for the injunction to come in. Right, and then, uh, and then uh, you know, Grace McCarthy had it in her head from 1980, the former cabinet minister in the uh, uh, old so social good. credit government, she had it in her, eye, her head that in, uh, in uh, 1986, the city would be celebrating 100 years and what should we do? Should there be something? Uh, at first it was gonna be a, trans, a, tra a fair on transportation and later they, um, Long story short, it morphed into being, you know, they went to the International Bureau of Expositions and it became Expo 86, so a world fair. Uh, and of course, then they realized that the roundhouse should be saved, right? Is that it? So it eventually yep. saving the roundhouse became a good idea, not a bad idea. 
And it also saved, it, it allowed, the, it was a way for the government to save face as well. And, you know, if, if you were young in the, eight, like in 86, the, the, the World's Fair was really a great thing because Vancouver really didn't have a nightlife. You, you went out you, and, you know, you, you went somewhere, you danced, you did whatever you did, you went home at 10. But this idea of having a place where you could actually uh, uh, spend an evening, I think that really changed us culturally in terms of thinking about uh, being downtown. And also, again, because of where it was located, it was so walkable. You could easily walk across a bridge coming back. So I, th I think it was really a great thing for the city. Of course, it also was the start of um, international interest in Vancouver as a place to build and, and to live. But did you, uh, you told me something about Expo 86 and w did you work with or uh, close by with Jimmy Patterson? Well, you know, it was interesting. Uh, Expo 86 nearly didn't happen. And um, it, there was a lot of factionism. There was actually a committee at City Hall and Chris Richardson, um, who has just retired from being, um, uh, what do you call him, uh, the auxiliary police officer? Yeah. But he's been yeah. a former commissioner. He was actually on the commission. And I was talking to you, I still have my button. It said, Expo, let's make it go. Uh, which is not, not you know, it's not the, like a great slogan, but there was a lot of factionism about it. And we almost lost the bid. And then I remember being called into a meeting with Jimmy Patterson. And um, as I said to you, I always, if you, ever, if you ever have a meeting with Mr. Patterson, check out his shoes. He always wears incredible shoes. So this very well uh, put together gentleman comes in and he just said to us all, look, he says, I'm going to make it go. I'm going to head it up. And we were, yeah, right. And he did. And he was able to kind of get the factionism together uh, or tell them they had to start working together. He, he was able to pull strings. He got people to uh, think about the idea and it became quite exciting as the countries decided to come in. So my work with that, I was still working in the health department at that point, uh, but there was, there was dumb stuff. Like they, they said you weren't gonna be allowed to bring your lunch into um, Expo 86. And so John yeah. Blatherwick, who was the medical health officer, the top line in the province, um, Blatherwick says, well, I'm bringing my damn lunch. So it became, I mean, that was the kind of politics we were talking about in those days. But as you know, it was extremely successful. And again, it showed Vancouverites that it's okay to walk and really embrace your city. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. <clears throat> uh, let me just see here. Um, oh, here we are. I got that. And I had another thing about, uh, oh yeah, the, um, the idea at Expo 86 of, of having drinking on the site and uh, uh, you know, the, the number of different bands and there were different venues and the Expo Theater in particular, but uh, uh, yeah, the, the, it really made, it really did change things for the city, for the positive. Yeah, some, pe some people say that the holding the fair uh, did put us on the map and now too many people wanted to come here and foreign investment and everything else, but uh, uh, on we went. Uh, somebody just had... Go and ahead. That was the first time. That was the first time Katie Lang was ever seen. Oh right, yeah, okay. Uh, somebody asked uh, when and how much did the provincial government get to sell the Expo lands to? Well, I remember it was uh, three hundred and fifty million dollars. Uh, the premier was uh, Bill Vanderzam, and many people. Um, well, I, I think we've had Michael Geller on our Zoom talker. One of our recent guests said. The idea to sell it to just one person, the, all the land, not in different parcels to different people, was, uh, was, I think they said, because it would have been easier to deal with one person having that one owner dealing with City Hall and so on and so on. The, I don't know if you know this or not, the history of that Expo 86 north side of False Creek goes back to the roughly the mid 1960s. The uh, city of Vancouver in that era was looking at the north side of the creek going, God Almighty, you know, we should, we should get that industrial crap out of there and we should start to develop, um, I don't know, parks or housing or something. And they had no end of trouble with CPR. Canadian Pacific Railroad just was like having no part of it. They didn't want to give up that land, no way on earth. And uh, so they, they just kind of, city said, okay, that's enough of that. And they gave up. So uh, if I recall, once uh, Grace McCarthy presented to the Premier, we got to do something for Expo for Vancouver in 1986. So this is not, now it's 1980. Um, mm -hmm. 
the premier got the uh, the premier and the grace and whoever said, wait a minute, how about if we get that land from CPR, we'll give them some land they do want downtown, we'll do a swap, a cash deal, uh, and then we'll deal with the city of Vancouver because the city couldn't deal with CPR, but they'll be able to deal with us after the fair and we'll be able to make that area into something. And uh, in a nutshell, that's what happened. Um, um, I was going to say something else on that point. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, I so, think, and I, and I think the fact that the man that bought it, uh, Mr. Li Kai Shing, he was yeah. known for doing these kind of development deals. So we knew that when he bought it. But there was a, there's an interesting wrinkle that um, uh, I, I think Mr. Sung is getting at, and that's that. And and this is and I was still in health, and and John was still there. And, and there are a couple of issues. One is that we're getting rid of our, our factories and our industrial, but that's also, that's also a place where a lot of people work. But in those days, we didn't think about uh, a diverse tax base. We just thought it was, might be a good idea. But one of the things that happened in that deal is that the city, uh, the, the province was made responsible for the remediation, for taking all those dirty and poisonous soils and making them good again. And the city of Vancouver's policy is that all that had to be done in place. So it means you can't scoop all that, that dirty soil out and redo it elsewhere. That's why you see gas stations off gas because we don't move the soil. We, we have to wait for two or three years to have it naturally ha happen in place using the correct techniques. So in actual fact, the province sold that land quite cheaply. I've never seen the final. It's a really good question because I've never seen the final and we're almost at the time, we can get that information now to know what, how much was done. So it was really a sweetheart deal for that developer and to have control of that whole piece of property um, right in, the, in False Creek. And people also forget that False Creek was really dirty. Uh, we used to have a, a funny story that uh, salmon would come up to Gramble Bridge and they come towards False Creek and they go, oh, no, thank you, and turn around and go back. Um, and, and I mean, it was, it was not, not great. And it's also not really natural. Remember at the time it used to go all the way up to Canby Street and there would just be a little tiny bridge till it got, uh, got uh, towards uh, Clark Drive, up to Clark Drive. Uh, Clark yeah, Drive, years, excuse me. Yeah, yeah, years and years ago. Um, and I think the, uh, you know, uh, in the mid 70s when the first part of the seawall on the south side went in here, uh, their theory was let's develop the south side and make that a little bit more of a low density. And over the years, uh, we'll finally get around to the north side, and that'll become high density. I think it's a, that's the picture in the background behind me right now. Is, I know. Uh, I, I'm in the south side looking. Uh, that picture's looking north. I can see a little bit of False Creek in the uh, distance there. But uh, I think it's come out well. And uh, the, uh, the south side now, especially from Science World along, towards Canby and Granville Bridge, is starting to see a few more high-rise buildings. But they're only in the 10... 12 story range, 14 stories. There's one that's maybe 14 stories. So the area is, uh, you know, the e Southeast Falls Creek is, is starting to develop more. There's uh, just right. on the uh, other side of the Canby Bridge on the uh, east side of it, right beside it, there's still a bit of undeveloped land there, but that will be playing fields and a couple of uh, uh, more parks and low rise, low rise uh, uh, towers. So it's, it's slowly moving along. And remember in the 70s, uh, that area of Falls Creek was just like, nobody could believe this worked, that they had stuck a whole bunch of different housing. There's housing that's rental, there's housing that's affordable, there's housing that's social, and there's housing that people have paid market price for. And, you know, everyone photographed this area because it worked. It, you know, something that happened here, it was a really nice mix. And what happened on the north side is that we've got into what we call Vancouverism, which is, the, which is that yeah. idea of having this big base, uh, and then you put the podium on top of it, and the big base is the is where you is it's one or two stories, and you have townhousing or stuff to get used to the idea that there's a, a much bigger base on top of taller towers. So yeah, it was a very different approach. Uh, somebody asked about the view corridors. I think you were telling me something about that the other day, because uh, now when you're on the south side here and you look north, you can't see as much of the mountains when. Trish and I moved into this suite in late 98. We had, uh, we had a view of both Lions Mountains and the, the other parts of the, the mountain there. And now we can see maybe one lion on a good day. So what, can you talk a little bit for a moment about the view corridors? How did that come about? 
Yeah, I've actually written an article in Vancouver is awesome, and I believe also in the Taiyi about it. Um, in, and we had a, an interesting head planner in the 70s. His name was Ray Spaxman. Oh, yes. And he, Ray, Ray, was from, Ray was from England. Um, he'll probably kill me for saying this, but he was a conscientious objector during the war. He's a very thoughtful, philosophical man. He has several kids. He said his biggest experience of coming to Canada was landing in Toronto. They got the kids into the car to go to where they're going. Oh my gosh, I forgot the stroller. He came back, the stroller was still there. So he, he, he's, he's, he's a real family man. One of the things he said about the downtown is that he wanted to see it look like a saddle. And the reason he wanted that shape of a saddle was so that, so that the mountains would, cro would crown the view. And it's a very thoughtful thing that he was doing. When, when you think, you can go to big cities like Sid Sydney, Australia, and even in London, if you get lost in London or in Sydney, Australia, you don't know where you are because there's no wayfinding. You can't see where you are. So th th even in the 80s and 90s, and we're one of the only cities in, in the world to do it, is we developed what we called view corridors. And that was the idea that the public, the consumer, the person that lived on the street, the protester, actually always had access to knowing where you were, but to be able to see the lions. So Canby Street is a, is a corridor. And you, um, I was... Um, I was, uh, I'm trying to say a nice word for being really angry. I, I was arguing that uh, the development that was going to go on the North Shore of False Creek, which was like this really squat Russian babushka doll that had these really tall towers, the towers are going to go to 40, 44 feet, or 44 stories, was going to actually take out one of the major view corridors. And the city was just going to quietly amend the bylaw to allow that. And of course, the way to you make that happen is you say, well, it's going to be for social housing. But the reality is that for a developer, he is privatizing what should be a public view. So um, you're right, some of the, the view corridors um, on Canby and Maine are starting to be encroached into, but I keep a really good eye on seeing what amendments they're doing. But that, that is a city right, and that's a public right, and, it's, and again, we're one of the only places in North America that have that. Other cities come to see how we did it. You can go online, just go City of Vancouver View Corridors, you can actually see a nice map of where they exist and how they're worked out. Fantastic, fantastic, yeah. Uh, let's see here, uh, anyone else have a question? Uh, do, uh, or someone just wrote one on chat there. Um, wondering about, oh, uh, do, uh, do, someone wants oh. to know much about the new art gallery, but that's a private thing, isn't it? The art gallery- I, I, can, I can talk to you about it, yeah. Sure, go ahead. Of course, Of course, none of this is gonna be recorded and you're not gonna tell other people about this. Yeah, you can't. Well, it is being recorded, but we, we won't yeah, show Don't use my name. <laughs> okay, so, so the art gallery is really interesting. Um, the, where, where the Vancouver Art Gallery is now was always kind of the center of the city. You remember in the old days, there was that big Bennett fountain that was in the front? Yes. Remember there was this big, it was kind of basalt and it was odd. Like really the one place in the world that you, you do not need a fountain in winter is Vancouver, but you know, that's just my outsider perspective. But that it, it, was, it was curious that um, the, the courthouse was always important. It, it's made by Rattenbury, um, was, was the architect. And he had an interesting time to remember he was murdered by his second wife. Yeah, we, uh, then, we uh, then, all, yeah, all you know the all Vancouver that guides know that story because yeah, of, uh, yeah. they also do the Victoria tour and the, the legislative building and so on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just a quick aside, um, I actually, talk to the author of the book Terry Rexton that wrote the yeah. book on the murder in the 80s and she actually went over to England and met the chauffeur that apparently killed him oh. <laughs> and 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 you know result, she said he was slow like he shouldn't have come out like he was not 100 percent with it because it was not the right thing to do but so it, it's interesting to see history still connect like that but the truth is that the Vancouver the old Vancouver Art Gallery is really the center of the city and Big Tom um, a couple of years a couple of years before he passed had done a design where he had thought of doing galleries below, uh, below the gallery. But what happened with this new one is that the city was trying to solve a problem. And the problem was the gallery needed a whole bunch of new space. And galleries being what they are internationally, they love to have new design. And they love to have, they like star architects, world-class architects. They got the firm Moran in, from, from Zurich. And you saw what the, what the design looked like. It was like Jenga. And, yeah. um, uh, and it doesn't have a ground plane. I actually have a friend that works in that firm in Zurich, 
and they, they never do a ground, and when I say ground plane, it doesn't connect well for you, for me as a walker going up to the building, but then that the, they intended to hoard it all off. Um, the challenge for the gallery, uh, and they've had some very, very generous donations by major philanthropists, is they still have to raise something like $150 million privately. So that has really been the challenge is how to raise that. And then who, who knew that COVID would come along and you know what that kind of reboot will be. But so I, um, the city has given them an option on the property. Uh, my understanding is the VA, uh, VAG is still waiting for, or Vancouver Art Gallery is still waiting for the feds to say if they are going to put the money in. But at this point, um, I'm not, I'm not 100% optimistic it, it will proceed. Well, I'm surprised that the um, building they're proposing for the old bus depot on Beattie and Georgia and so on, uh, you know, like you said, it looks a little bit like a Jenga thingy. Uh, you know, they're always, uh, museums in general, but especially the art gallery, always complain they don't have enough space. And I was thinking that their new building, if they're going to build it on that block, would take more advantage of the whole block, build yourself a much bigger building. But uh, anyway, and another thing that kind of surprised me was they didn't take over uh, at least one of those massive floor plates on the old post office, which is now being rebuilt. I understand yeah. Amazon's got a big chunk of that. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and also what we forget about that art gallery site is that we're also going to have two uh, towers on that site as well. So, you know, it, it, it talks about what's important at the city at, at, at what point in time. And right now for us, it's about the post-COVID recovery, but it's also about affordability and accessibility. And um, the idea of art uh, it isn't something that's coming top of mind to everyone. And there's also always been the struggle between the old Rattenberry Courthouse and this one. And I think that will continue for a while more because we know that still in the, in, in the way the city is, uh, where the Vancouver Art Gallery is now, is really seen kind of as the center of the city and it's a place of protest and it's the place where people go for expression. So. What do you think should be done? I, I mean, I'm not, I, I'm not suggesting that the, uh, when the art gallery finally gets their new digs and they move out of the old courthouse, what would be a good thing for the old courthouse? And uh, also, uh, I'd wanna ask your thoughts if you have any on, uh, now that the Emily Carr people have moved out of Granville Island, as one of the two buildings is still vacant, and I'm just trying to think, well, you know, they've, they've been thinking for years, gee, what are we gonna put in there? You know, those are really good questions and I should ask you because uh, you folks know more about um, new technology and where, what you're hearing from people. And again, this is the problem we have in Vancouver where we don't have large corporate offices. We don't have like the head office of Google or the head office of Microsoft um, to have a philanthropist that will just come in and put a whole bunch of money into redoing a facility. But, um, you know, I, 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 I like places where people can get together and do stuff. I'm a real fan of the library. I think we have one of the best library systems in the world. Um, you know, you can rent an instrument, you can go and record a song, uh, you, can, you, can, you can do a film in our libraries. So I would love to see it become some kind of community use. But again, it really has to go through a process where people start talking about what they would like to see that building be. But as I say, it's always, there's always someone sitting there. It's a great place for public art. It would be lovely if it could still be an adjunct, but I don't know. I think we really need to rethink about how we see ourselves in an art and um, cultural place coming out of, a, uh, coming out of the COVID recovery. Mm. Yeah, the, the, the thing that surprises me most about the uh, now abandoned Emily Carr building on Granville Island is that uh, nobody's come up with a really good idea. Now, one suggestion right. was maybe the building could be kept as it is and turned into a, a, um, a couple of smaller movie theaters, but a lot of people were against that. They didn't like that yeah. idea. Uh, live yeah. venue, maybe, live theater, uh, but uh, but still, even Granville Island, if you ask them, and I was at some meetings with them over the last two years regarding their parking issues, and we would say to them, any idea on what could, it could become? And they go, no, no, nobody's had a good suggestion. And it's the same thing now with the Vancouver Art Gallery or the old courthouse. When, it, when the art gallery moves out, what might that be a good use for? Right. But, so. but also remember, remember, 
Granville Island's under federal jurisdiction. Oh, I realize that. So as, yeah. as soon as you go on that causeway and you're into that traffic jam, which must really annoy you as, as tour guides, I could never understand why we have free range cars on Granville Island, but that's still how the, fed, the feds are dealing with it. And remember what a wonderful buzz it was having those students down there. I, I loved it when the, the students were there because it just activated everything. Mm -hmm. so, so what is the group that would bring in that same kind of buzz and keep that building busy? Is it another school? Is it um, uh, like where, where are we going in the next ten years? Mm -hmm. You know, I, and I do remember that there was going there was a proposal, and Michael Selig, who had developed the big restaurant down there, Bridges, had put in a wanted to do a, a couple of movie theaters down there twenty years ago, and the whole community put that down quite quickly. So it, it's really uh, the, I, the other problem is how you deal with the feds. Get the yeah, feds and the part and the dealing and the parking issue, whatever it is you put in there, if it becomes really popular, do you still allow cars to come into the area? The other aspect of Granville Island is there's nowhere nearby where you could park and walk in. You know, it's right. all residential around there or a little bit of light industrial along Second Avenue and Fur and so on. So, uh, so yeah, t t difficult issue. Well, let's see, uh, you mentioned the other day about um, you worked on raised crosswalks, you, like the type that's in Whistler. Is that something that we're going to see more yeah. of? Yeah, or the ones, you know, the, if you're going out to, uh, to the airport and you've got those huge um, traffic bumps. humps. Speed bumps. Yeah, but no, there's a difference. There's humps and there's bumps. Seriously, uh, there's a difference. <laughs> and a hump, a hump is much longer. A bump is more like you really feel the back of the car go. But yeah, yeah I, I think one of the things that um, Green... When I was working in Greenways and Green Street throughout the city, we also we also used it as a time to look at innovative ways to do engineering stuff that that might be cool to use elsewhere. So we did things like um, we did ditches instead of um, uh, instead of sewers with baffles on them, and we tried raised crosswalks outside of schools. Um, there's one at Lord Selkirk Elementary, which is on Commercial Street, and I think it's 23rd, 24th East. I'm sure someone will know exactly where that is. And the whole idea of a raised crosswalk is that it's, it's um, a big traffic hump because it's wide and it's long, but the child comes off the sidewalk and the kid is still at the same level crossing. So it, it visually changes how a driver sees that a person crossing and, and it, it automatically will slow down. So they've been quite effective and successful. I, I think one of the things, Vancouver's done a lot of stuff when biking. They've not been as good at keeping up with walking and um, ensuring that people have easy access to, um, uh, with, with, if, if, you're, if you're in a wheelchair or something, to making that easy, an easy experience on the street. So uh, if, if those of you that have been to, uh, somebody's uh, mic is open by the way. If you, uh, Jim Curry, Jim Curry, can you turn your microphone off please? Mute your microphone. Jim Curry, mute your microphone. Um, uh, the uh, in Whistler they have the uh, raised crosswalks and boy it's, you sh you sure learn quickly oh you got to slow down at the crosswalk yeah. whether someone's yeah. there or not because you don't want your car or bus to banging right. over these uh, the speed bumps do you know uh, I saw it was downtown uh, yesterday and I was reminded of the crosswalks and when you are standing on the corner and you first start to step off the curb you used to see the uh, words look with an arrow and maybe a set of eyeballs. I thought that was a great program and I'm sorry, it's there, all the paint on those is faded now. You know right. who created that and why it's not being saved? Well, you know, I, again, we're talking about the evolution of the city. And, and since, um, since 2010, when, when Vision came in to, to be the party in power, they had this really green focus of things. And so the green focus really went, um, went into sustainability. So they were not as happy doing a lot of the painting. Uh, I'm on the other hand, I'm on the side where, yeah, you have to put that kind of stuff on. Um, and we have a prime example. The guy who was the head planner uh, for the park board, he sailed a boat to Sydney, Australia. He got off the boat. He goes to the corner. He goes to cross. He looks left. He goes, looks right. The car is coming from the wrong side. He was hit. He was put into a hospital for 30 days and had to fly home. So yeah, I think the look, look, look left, look right is still really important, especially in a town. Um, I mean, you know the numbers. Um, how much tourism do we bring in in the summer? 
Uh, well, we had uh, the last year's statistics aren't out, but in uh, 2018, I think it was 10.3 million visits, exactly. uh, overnight visits, and that number I predicted would be higher for 2019. Uh, right. And I don't think those stats have been released, or if they if they came out, uh, they got swallowed right. up by COVID news. Uh, but of course, this year would be a, would be a you know. It'll be, be right. lucky if we get but, five million overnight visits. But if, you're bringing, but if you're bringing those kind of numbers in, you and someone is coming off a boat or coming out of a hotel, they have to have a, a set of what the rules of engagement are in the street. And so I think anything you can do to do that is great. One of the things the city does do is that we don't have big buttons. You don't have to usually press a downtown to, to a pedestrian button to cross. And one of the things that's really unusual is that we cycle through when pedestrians can cross on those traffic lights 24 yeah. seven. One of the other things the city is now looking at is called a leading pedestrian interval or LPI. And what that means is you're gonna come up to a corner and you're able to cross before the traffic that's going the same direction is crossing. Um, they, they've done this about in 2000 intersections in New York City. They've actually got, uh, found their mortality rate fell 40 to 60% their mortality in, in and injury rate just by allowing pedestrians a 10 second lead to start crossing, crossing the road. So, you know, I, I think in your work, um, you, are, you are the detail, you see this kind of stuff at the city. And it's really important for tour guides to tell the city what you're seeing, because you're getting not only the response of tourism, and that's our most important thing in this province, but you also have a sense of what we can do better. It's God is in the detail of how you do a city and walking and how people connect is, is number one. Yeah, well, uh, you know, those, um, uh, there's a couple of spots downtown uh, along Howe Street at uh, Nelson, Howe Street uh, at Georgia, that one in particular, if you're on the, uh, uh, you'll notice that there's occasionally some walk, walk, don't walk, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. lights up for the pedestrians that are delayed. And when they first started introducing that, people weren't used to it and they started to bolt off the, the curve. So I called City Hall up at least twice and got them to put up those delayed walk signs that are there. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but uh, someone else just pointed out on the chat, you know, those uh, arrows on the pavement, look, with so many people now, they're, they're constantly looking at their phone and they don't, uh, you know, but they might just see that look on the pavement. And I, I, I'm just surprised that that didn't uh, last longer, but, uh, uh, anyway, interesting. And there, two, and there are two things that are happening uh, internationally and, and are going to happen in BC. One is we're going to start limiting, um, limiting speed. This, if you can limit speed in cities to 30 kilometers an hour, that increases your, if you get hit, that increases your chance of surviving by 90%. If you're hit at 50K, you have a 10% chance of survival. In any place that's talking about walkability and tourism and people, we need to do that. Um, it, 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 30K is 20 in Great Britain, so it's called 20 is plenty there. And most of the major cities have adopted it really successfully. It's been wildly successful. So that will help too with tourism. And we, and we just have to get used to the idea that you know, if, you, if you're privileged to be in a car, you have to go slower. Yeah. And it also makes it much easier for community. And we're going to be, look at the seniors. Um, and I'm going to be counting myself nearly as one of them, is that, um, we, we do go slower. International standards show that we're going much slower than what the, 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 the walk time is allowed on city streets. We have to factor that in as well. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I, I laugh at some people saying uh, that buy these uh, high-end cars over at 2nd and Burrard, you can't really drive those cars more than no 100 way. yards before somebody will get in front of you and slow you right down. Uh, somebody asked if you know anything more about the Granville Bridge project, which I know they're, uh, they're doing some more seismic work on it, and uh, they're still talking. Uh, I think they've agreed to the uh, widened sidewalks, at least on one side, but the elevator issue is still not confirmed yet. Right, and, and you know, it's, it's an interesting time again in the city. Um, uh, in terms of the politics at City Hall, engineering is one of the only areas that have had the engineers come up through it. We don't go and get somebody from outside to lead the department. And it has a, a really strong engineer. His name is Long Claire. 
and he's he's a world class guy. This person, he's he understands ecology and he's really into walkability and making cities safe. And one of the problems with Granville Bridge, as you know, is trying is how you get off it if you're walking across it. It's impossible because you have to kind of go down the ramp. Or you're deking across traffic. So that was the idea of the sidewalk. Is to, is to widen the sidewalk and also have a, um, a, an elevator coming down. And, and again, that would connect into uh, Falls Creek. But there's another opportunity, right? Whoever the developer is that does the work in the Emily Carr, uh, Emily, the old Emily Carr College at Granville, Granville Island, wouldn't it be great if they could also do some kind of theming with the elevator and with development and provide some some money to make that connection better going down. So um, I think it's still on the table. The challenge is gonna be how financing is going to be reaching post COVID. Now, some things are still gonna go ahead. At this point, um, the subway that is planned, the extension from Broadway to Arbutus, uh, that money is already in the can. It's already in the collection can. And I know that that, that is something that will probably be put on as um, a piece to perk the, the economy. And that will spark all kinds of redevelopments along Broadway. And of course, the next piece will be how you go from Arbutus out to UBC, whether it's a streetcar line or whether it's, it's going to be underground. And we'll know in the next, next couple of years how the economics for that one will work. Uh, you mentioned something the uh, other day when we spoke about each new mayor and something about an American system of, of uh -oh. government. What was that again? Yeah, I wanted, you know, I never expected to be fascinated by, um, by the way the city worked, but um, Vancouver's, Vancouver has been different from any other city in North America because the staff that have been the city managers have always come up through, through working at City Hall. They start out as planning assistants or a rod man out surveying, and they've eventually come up into the city manager's office. So they knew everybody. And the work that we did at the city was always based on city policy that had passed through the city managers. It didn't change um, for each, each different um, uh, mayor that came in. In the American system, what you do is you run an election, you come in, you're the new mayor, you immediately fire the city manager and you fire the major managers and you put your own people in. And we never had that. We had this very consistent way of, of uh, a group of people that had worked their way through that led and discussed all the policy for the city. That's, that's what made Vancouver different from any North American city. But what's happened now since 2010 is that that was disrupted. Um, Judy Rogers, she actually had worked uh, with the First Nations and worked in Equal Employment Opportunities Office and had worked her way uh, up into the city manager's office. She was fired in 2010. Um, the, the head engineer who was also the assistant manager, city manager was fired. That was Dave Rubberg. And we brought in, um, uh, Dr. Penny Ballum and Sadhu Johnson, who's a wonderful individual, came in. And, I, and as I said to you, I actually had met him in Chicago because he did a lot of work in sustainability. And so we have now become kind of like that, but we've had this disruption and the city is more administrative and it's really run by what the mayor and council would like to achieve versus what the policy work that would have preceded the four years prior to them coming in has worked at and was doing. Yeah, uh, you uh, you mentioned uh, the other day. Uh, so Jim Curry, if you can hear me, would you please turn off your microphone? Please yeah. mute your microphone. Yeah. yeah can uh, you hear me? Yes, and we don't. We keep hearing the uh, chimes for the bus and so on. Can you mute your microphone, please? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. He's having. Uh, he's have, Jim's having the most fun of all of us. Yeah. Yeah. I think. I think so. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he's usually riding his bike, by the way. Um, Good man. You said that when uh, the city planning department went downhill after Vision Vancouver came along, because they had a I whole don't think different. I, used I the term downhill. Uh, I wrote downhill, but we won't <laughs> we won't show this to anyone. Okay, right. <laughs> but you're not the first okay. guest we've had okay. to talk okay. about how yeah. the city changed yeah. big time once Vision Vancouver came in. Their whole right. vision was like. Whoa! It was and it was American. It was American the way American style system. Yeah, but I, I think what happened in two thousand uh, when when the vision, when vision came in too that um, uh, there were a number of changes at City Hall. Like when I had worked there, it was a four day work week, 
and you think about that. If you had kids, um, you would have one extra day that you didn't have to do childcare. Or in my case, I, I became a master gardener um, and did stuff at Van Dusen. And, and it, was, it was a learning opportunity that fifth day. So we could attract international talent to come to Vancouver um, <laughs> because this was like a 20% perk, right? To have 20% more salary and having the extra day. And we just worked extremely long hours. And the point of that was firstly to, for traffic congestion, and secondly, so that if we were in there at eight o'clock or 8.30, uh, if we're there from eight to, to, to 5.30, you, you could get in there after your work day if you wanted to talk to someone. So I talked about a more connected place. Uh, but I think in every, every city there's, there's ups and there's downs. And um, it was just a bit of a different working style. Um, and and I, I think also a lot of people were starting to retire or like me, I left early because I had okay. international opportunities to work. And you know that's one of the one of the problems of of working in a really great place like Vancouver, is that um, it opens your opportunity to work elsewhere, and so I was very blessed in that. I don't think your mic's on. Yeah, no, I was uh, Trish. Uh, Trish was uh, trying to tell me something, but uh, uh, she's going to go for a little walk up and down the hall now, so that's okay. Uh, yeah, the uh, the changing over of. Um, uh, ha, ha, since Kennedy Stewart came in, he strikes me as being, I, I'm sort of okay. I think, I think he's been doing a good job in the council. Uh, is this council working okay with each other? I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a one or two NPA, there's one or two green, there's, a, you know, and so yeah. on and so on. Uh, has that been in your eyes? It been a, it, you know, the last election, is, does it vote well for the city? Well, you know, Mr. Stewart is a real parliamentarian. And if you, um, you can actually listen on Tuesdays to the discussion, and he's a really good par parliamentarian. Um, th this is an unusual council. And you know, in the old days, um, people went for, they, they voted by party. They voted for the NPA, or they voted for COPE. Um, they, they voted by party. And the, the NPA was more, sort of supposedly more business. COPE was supposedly more socialist, but they had ways that they would have voting blocks through council. And we don't have a word system. You know, if you have a problem at City Hall, you, you feel like you have to call 311 or you use my secret quick find. And someone had asked whether there's quick find for other municipalities. Uh, I don't know, but I'll ask the other planners and other municipalities. And if they are, are some, I'll let you know, Jeff. But um, <laughs> the problem well, has to, I see, the challenge with this council. Is, the, is that none well, of work ahead, together? Finish your train of thought, but that yeah. was my next question. Is the ward system a bit, should we go back to that or should we stay at large? Well, you know what's funny? The councillors think that they love the uh, at large system, especially if their name starts with A, B, C, D, E, or F. If you yeah. look at who's been elected, it's been like Suzanne yeah. Anton, Elizabeth Ball, uh, Kim Capri. If, you're, if, you're, if your name was in the top, six or seven letters, you did well because that used to be the ballot. And last time they did it random. And it was awful. If you saw the ballot, it was this long. And you know, no, and, so, and some, some people are smart. They get these little templates that the parties had and you put the template up and you just check off the boxes. But the challenge here is that all these people are very strong individuals. Um, they're all wonderful, but you know, part of the stuff is storming, norming and performing. And we haven't got to the performing part yet. They, they're still not really working together. It seems to be taking a long time to get um, uh, issues out. And the, the, count, the, the, the minutes, the meetings are going quite long, but um, it is, I think what this will mean is that people will want to come back into more um, voting by, by party. And in terms of wards, I think they're a good thing personally, because if, if I have a problem in my neighborhood, I want to be able to know who I can contact about it. And right now, if you want to contact a counselor, you just have to pick, pick one of them. You just don't know who, who lives in what area. No one has that jurisdiction. Uh, yes, uh, yes, indeed. Uh, what was the other thing I had in my notes here? Um, oh, uh, we talked uh, just for a moment about uh, the, uh, many of us do belong to, we used to belong to Car to Go and Evo. Now Evo is the only one left. Yeah. And, and you were saying yeah. that, well, I, I, you can park an Evo car in a residential parking area only. I, I, do, I knew that, but there were two or three other, what, what are the other places you can park where it's okay and you don't have to worry about the car when you leave it? 
the, the resident. Uh, I the think res I was, talk I was talking about disabled parking permits. Okay. If you have a disabled parking permit. Oh, a disabled park. Okay, yeah. A disabled, yeah. If you if you have a disabled parking permit, it, um, and it and you have it mounted, you can park yeah. uh, for three hours in any residential parking area. We said RPO. You can park yeah. that vehicle there for up to three hours. And you can also park in loading zones. Um, I think it might be for 30 minutes. Like, I'll just check. Yeah. Okay, very good. Um, and you can also park in loading areas as well. Again, I think it's for about 30 minutes. Yeah, yeah. Now, we don't see it, we don't see it too often. Some mayors don't wear it. I like Tom Terrific wore it every day he could. The uh, chain did. of office famous. Right, uh, right. Necklace that goes all the way around, and um, uh, have I actually haven't seen that being worn in a while? But uh, I think I think Ro uh, Gregor Robinson used to wear it um, on just the day he was sworn in, as he won yeah. successive elections. But you were saying it's worth quite a lot of money now. Yeah, I worked in Greg. I was in the protocol team during the 2010 Olympic Games, so I was in his office. And if you ever want to have fun, just go into the mayor's office and look in his closet. Uh, you know, they used to have things like there's a replica of the King, um, King John's broadsword that was used for the signing of the Magna Carta. Um, for some reason, there was one in, in the back closet. But um, in terms of that chain of office, it's really interesting to look at. It's made by Burks. It's uh, 14 karat gold, so it's not, it's not like fine gold. But it's got um, illustrations of different parts of Vancouver and the province and in, in that big chain. Um, and as well, there's this gigantic mace um, and the mace that is ca it's carried into uh, council and put on the table so that it's showing that there's law and order so that council can talk. That mace is a replica of the one that's used for the city of London in England. Um, and, and what's really interesting about it is it's one of, of, of two pieces of hallmarked regalia that came out from King Edward, the one that in the 1930s that took off with Mrs. Wallace, it's one of only two pieces of, of silver that's been hallmarked. And again, here's a secret of the city. Uh, 20 years ago, we had um, like a heritage fair and we had appraisers come in uh, from Maynard's. And one of the people was Mr. Balmer. He has also handled and appraised the city of London in England's mace. And at that time, that mace was appraised in the 300 to $400,000 range. And that was 20 years ago. Um, it's it it is silver with a gold gilt, and the gold chain at that time was about 100, 110, 100 to 200 thousand dollars. So, um, in terms of today, they're almost priceless when you think of what they mean for the city and the fact that we have this regalia that have this incredible history. But it's also kind of cool to know that um, uh, they really reflect who we are. Wow. Okay. Well, we've gone. We've uh, we've uh, achieved getting uh, to uh, you know getting at least half an hour, forty five minutes. We've gone to an hour, and I'm just reading right. a comment here from one of our. Uh, oh, it's from Marlene. I don't think we got a chance to introduce you to Marlene uh, Kumnik. Uh, uh, she's our uh, CTGA president. But uh, right. thanks again for an interesting, informative session. Uh, very uh, nice to hear from you, Sandy. Would love a return visit. I think she's had to leave, and so we'll uh, we'll be back uh, next week. Is uh, Tuesday, June thirtieth, just before Canada Day, and we'll do that one at eleven o'clock, and we'll we'll start the following week at ten thirty in the morning. Move it up a little bit, but uh, everybody should get a big Canada flag if you can, or some small flags, because someone on our building has already put up a big Canada flag on the uh, my building's um, other side there. So we're getting ready for uh, what will be a strange Canada day this year, to say the least. Did you have any uh, any thought, last thoughts, or something you wanted to share with us, or any questions for us? You're... Yeah, I, I, I can give you one more secret of the city. Oh, good. Did you know the mayor has a secret elevator? I figured that out based on the reporters that uh, sometimes would wait for them to come out and uh, yeah. then, you know, Hey, where is he? And the secretary yeah, go, there's, oh, a, there's, a, there, there's a secret elevator in his office that can go, it goes straight down to the basement and out. But um, no, I, 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 I'm really honored to talk with you. And I just, one of the questions I had was um, in Vancouver, when you have people 
what are people most interested in, in terms of what they see in the city? Well, that's changing a little bit over the years. For, for many, many years, it was uh, what um, one of my old bosses at Grayline used to say was the bread and butter. Uh, get me on a tour bus. What is it I'm supposed to see here? Oh, it's Chinatown, Gastown. Go to Stanley Park. Get around on the uh, English Bay side of the park and go by English Bay Beach, Sunset Beach. Maybe get up to Queen Elizabeth Park or go to Granville Island. And now there's a really big market for people who want to do the uh, rent the bikes. Uh, many people have heard about our longest, um, uh, the world's longest oceanside walkway, the seawall, at about right. 16, 16 miles ish, or about 26, 27 kilometers. And uh, yeah, there, the, you know, the bike shops, the uh, Cycle City tours on Hornby by the HSBC building there, across the street from Highs or down on Denman Street in Georgia. You know, getting a bike going, and many of the hotels now, uh, interestingly enough, the uh, two uh, Fairmont hotels that are a block from each other, the Fairmont Waterfront and the Fairmont Pacific Rim, uh, if you stay at the Waterfront Fairmont, uh, I think they have bikes for you, push bikes, but if you go to the, stay at the Fairmont Pacific Rim, they've got electric bikes you can oh. use for free, so, uh, yeah. yeah, so, um uh, yeah, it, they they want to know. They want to know. Yeah, they want to know. Some people come here just like they they finally get here and they've done no research and they'll ask the concierges or they'll ask you as a tour guide because you're the first real person that they're gonna who knows about sightseeing and so on. So what else should we see after we're done with right. you today? What should we go back to and explore? Um, um, so uh, the, the bottom line is still the, the, the main sites and then they want to break it down into, uh, well, commercial drive or walking up and down some of the neighborhoods like Strathcona along uh, Union Street, which Trish and I yeah. did again last week and uh, architecture tours, uh, foodie tours. The foodie tours yeah. are really becoming big, very big. Uh, I, I hope they can do at least a little bit of business this year, but uh, Yes, that's, the, that's kind of interesting. Walking tours have faded in and out over the years. Uh, we used to have a lady named Margaret Leonard who did walking tours. She had a, a set thing uh, week in and week out, I think it was. She would uh, maybe on Monday, she would do a walking tour of downtown, maybe twice oh, a day. And then uh, some, uh, lead, lead uh, other days, uh, just Chinatown, just Gastown. Um, it's funny how they walking tours come and go. And now, Nowadays, you can, uh, you can, some people, are, I don't know about exactly now, but uh, do they, there's still some signs up here and there on a couple of lampposts throughout downtown where it says, if you go to your cell phone and text this number or dial this number, you can hear a one yeah. or two minute spiel. Oh, and the, yeah. uh, forgetting about the um, Will Woods and the um, Forbidden Tours or the walking tours yeah. that are at night and uh, stories yeah. about old Vancouver and sometimes... Yeah ghost stories and uh, real stories of uh, a scandal and so on and so on. And I see someone just put something up on chat here. Garden tours. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, that's great. There's a group I've done every year for the last number of years. They, they come here specifically to see gardens. With me, we not only do a city tour, but we physically get the bus somewhere near the Rose Garden, which is having its 100th anniversary uh, right now. Uh, wow. and Stanley Park and uh, then they would we would uh, either with me or with other uh, on their own go to Van Dusen of course eventually make their way over to Victoria for the butcher gardens and so on and so on right. so yeah there's no end of different aspects of what people want to see now over and above just let me on a bus for two or three four hours and have the quick overview and then we'll figure things out from ourselves for ourselves you know. right. Right. And, and that overview is so important because then you find out what the person's really interested in. And one of the secrets you and I discussed uh, when we first talked is about sunset nurseries that yeah. most of the plants, every plant you see in Stanley Park and every flower you see in the city from poinsettias in the wintertime in any civic facility are all grown from sunset nursery, from leaf culture. And, that's and tell, pe like you tell people where it is because even if you go there, you have to kind of yeah, over it's, fence or a hedge. It's, yeah, it's down at uh, 51st and Sophia, which is off Main Street. And it's actually in behind the Sunset Community Center. And they, there's an apprentice program. Uh, but we are one of the only places in North America that still grow our own flowers from seed. So it's, it's a pretty remarkable thing. It's not celebrated. 
and you know it, it's always it, it, people want to put it on the chopping block but it is such a wonderful thing it really comes back to our to us as a garden culture yeah yeah okay we've got some other folks who've also had to uh leave the group because uh we yeah. frequently we're we're longer than an hour on this so uh, see we've been uh, i've been on about an hour and 30 minutes so anyway sandy thanks a million so uh, we'll be in touch and I understand you also uh, you write some uh, on pricetags.ca which is gordon uh, i do price this thing. Yeah. and uh, where and, else do you write uh, and i also speak on cbc on cbc radio with uh, gloria makarenko and Michelle Elliott, and um, I'm, I'm currently writing a book on the, um, the Georgia viaducts. <laughs> oh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the one before the, per, the current viaduct and the current viaducts. Yeah, and that's right. They're still scheduled to come down, right? Well, they're scheduled to come down, but uh, no, they're not scheduled. They're kind of budgeted from five years ago to come down, but that really is predicated on having the money for them to come down and that's predicated on having the development to, to, to support them coming down. So yeah. I think that's gonna be a longer play than we had originally anticipated. Yeah, yeah, the developer um, says they can put up a few more buildings and more park space if those viaducts come down. Yet oddly enough, they're coming down at a time when St. Paul's will be moving over to that end of the, exactly. uh, the George viaduct at the east end of the viaduct that where it comes off right. at Gore Street is, is the new location of uh, a part of St. Paul's. Uh, that's another thing that they'll have to figure out what to do. When St. Paul's moves out of there, uh, can they renovate and uh, se seismically upgrade that building and should it be kept or is it in such decay that it should come down and what should go up in its place? It's a very interesting discussion and I, I think that the, I think we know the answer to that one and I think it will probably be sold off for, for development unfortunately, yeah. but it's a yeah. very cool building. Yeah. Okay. Well, you're welcome to stay. We're just going to talk for a few more minutes with, uh, with a few of the, um, uh, someone just wrote, uh, great Zoom. Thank you for the interesting female guest. Well, as I yes, said, nice. I'm, I'm really, I'm, really happy to be here. I've been trying to get <laughs> other female guests and also I've been trying to get, uh, 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 Sandy, do you know how to reach uh, Andy Yan? I've been trying to find an email I, for him. I had lunch with him yesterday. Oh, well, can you can you talk with him <laughs> yeah. or text him or something and get him to e yeah. give him my email address. I'd love to him for to sure. be our speaker next week. Yeah. Oh, he's just fabulous. Uh, yeah. And uh, he's, he's just a just a great individual. He's our Duke of data, for sure. <laughs> anyway, I'll let you I'll let you have the privacy of your meeting. Thank you. And thank you very much for for representing our city so well. Thank oh, you so right. much, everybody. Yeah. Thanks we for the love, opportunity. We're all, we're all, we all love to uh, to help people and to give information you about do. our great, our great city. So, all right. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you, you so much. much. It was an honor. Thanks, Take care. Bye bye. Right. Bye bye for now. Right. Yeah. Bye. bye bye. Okay. So, CTGA members, uh, 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 do you have any uh, questions or comments or anything at all about anything, any topic there? See Jim still riding the bus. Jim, where are you going? You've been on that bus for 45 minutes. <laughs> well, your mic, Jim, your mic isn't on now. Now that we want the mic on, it's not on. <laughs> okay, Matthew, are you back at home or you want to talk a little bit about our YouTube uh, situation? I think Marlene had to go, by the way, so she's already gone. Uh, yeah, hi, everyone. Um, was in and out there. Accidentally, um, just wanted to to uh, you know just quickly remind everyone the the channel is up. Uh, if you do subscribe, when you click on the link to go to our YouTube channel, uh, it's not going to give you any any um, you know spam or anything like that, but it will help our statistics um, uh, to build that up. Uh, what I'd like to do is, uh, as we go with all of this, I'd like to be able to get some photos submitted from the membership uh, for the for the you know, other media channels in general. In particular, uh, I'd like to be able to get some photos of mountains and rivers. If it's possible for any of you to send along any photos that you have from your trips guiding throughout DC, 
uh, of mountains and rivers. That's going to be kind of the initial theme for the first little bit. So that's the that's the main thing. If you could send that to media at ctgaofbc.com, that would be appreciated. Just, just a couple of pictures, just email them off. That'll be great. So we'll get you credited and such. And then, uh, yeah, we'll go from there. That's pretty much all on my end of things. And if, uh, if you uh, haven't kind of been doing that, because when you're on tour, sometimes you forget to take pictures yourself. Uh, if you get on tour this year, uh, take a few snaps. If you don't tour again till next year, uh, uh, do that. Uh, take pictures yeah, it, next year. It doesn't have to be current. Just anything that you've had over the last couple of years. I want to start off with some just landscape themes for the first uh, first number of posts and such. So if you could just that one would be the best one. That would be the, the easiest way for us to, to start with this. I'm going to post the YouTube channel link here into the chat as well. Um, and then uh, we'll go. And it was, uh, if, if uh, you folks have been keeping your last couple of uh, emails from Gary, uh, uh, one was from Matthew and it had the link on there as well, but he's just gonna post that on the uh, chat right now. And uh, it's quite simply youtube.com uh, and then CPG Media. No, it's, 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 not, it's not actually. Um, that's part of the reason why we need to have 100 subscribers. So uh, if we can get 100 subscribers, then we can have our own custom URL. So that's what, I, that's what I'm hoping to be able to get. If we can get 100 subscribers, we said we can turn off your notifications, that sort of stuff. But it then goes, YouTube's like, oh, okay, you're legitimate. You, we can now have you guys uh, rename your channel yourself to make it easier. Because right now it's just a bunch of numbers and that's more confusing. <laughs> yeah. Can you yeah. Have the, the link to get also to be yeah, I've, I've just posted it up and I'll make sure that the current link uh, will go into the chat with uh, into the email that Gary will put out for sure. Okay. Yeah, and if, if, if any of you uh, didn't tune in to the very, very start of the meeting around 11.04 or 11.05 a.m. this morning, I mentioned that uh, some of the, uh, all of the coach videos, the first set of them that we did, and I took some more coach videos uh, a week or so ago that we're also going to post up there. They're, they're all worth a look, especially if you're trying to get it in your head. What would I do if this happened? And then you can just watch the video again. And sometimes by watching the second set of videos, it, I, I did it a little differently. Maybe I did it a little better. So, uh, but eventually we're going to have other videos on there, stuff that'll be about interesting commentary and uh, just bits of things where, where, uh, you know, it, there's been many blessings for this COVID thing because we wouldn't have had time. It wouldn't have happened probably till this fall or later uh, if COVID hadn't come along and put a complete stop to our, our, our normal year of things that we normally all do, so. Yeah, we have, we have a lot of experience within the group and uh, we're hoping as we develop things to be able to uh, have everyone share some of those experiences. So just keep that in mind for everyone right now. Um, we're, not, we're not going there yet, but it is going to be something that we would like everyone to be a part of, you know, to share those experiences with us um, as, as we go on. Uh, we have the time this year, fortunately, to be able to do this. So before things get busy again next year, we want to really, you know, establish, you know, this uh, and, 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 and share that, that experience and those experiences with other members and other potential members as well. Matthew, a question for you, Jermaine. Yes. I'm wondering is the YouTube uh, restricted to only our members or can other people subscribe? So cer certain things will be restricted to members only. Um, part of this is also to make sure that we have a public face because we want people to know about us. People, people know about us and about the membership. They're more likely to hire us to provide services for them and such. So, you know, the, there, there will be certain things, certain things like, um, uh, like the, the how to's and that sort of stuff, you know, they generally won't be made public. It'll be more for membership only, but there are certain things that we, we do want to have go out to public. There's not a lot of content on there right now, about 20 videos. Um, most of it's public right now. 
simply to help us build up the initial statistics because you have to have a subscribers and you also have so many hours of viewing within a, within a year sort of thing. So the more that's public right now, the more people are, 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 are watching it at the moment. We also want to, you know, give people reasons to be able to come in and, and join, join us, right? To be able to be privy to these things. Okay, that's good. Just so we can ask other people to subscribe as well to put the. Oh, abs abs absolutely! Please have them subscribe to the channel. As many people, we want we want tourism to be a part of this. We are a part of tourism. We represent, you know, ourselves. We represent different companies and organizations. Not everyone's working fully in the tourism sort of stuff, but you know, we're 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 a part of, you know, BC and in particular, most of us are in Vancouver. We're we're. We're, we're representing these areas. So we want the knowledge that we have to be shared amongst the people that are coming here and the, the, the people that are a part of it. We want to be visible. We're a visible organization by our nature. We all want to be in front of people, right? So this is just another method to be able to do it. And one that's particularly revel relevant in the times that we have where we can't have the large groups of people getting together. Okay, thank you. No problem. Yeah. I hope all of our members know, I think, I think probably 90% of you know, we do have some members who are from outside of Vancouver, from uh, different parts of the province, Vancouver Island and so on, and even in Alberta. Uh, we used to, we, we, we welcome the Alberta members, uh, tour guides and tour directors, because they, uh, you know, they don't have an association there and they, um, I think they're feeling a little more include, included now that there's uh, some of these Facebook groups like the uh, BC Alberta Tour Drivers and Tour Director got a group and so on, but they, they should really belong to a, an official organization. We used to have one fellow in Seattle, David Gore, and he's a Canadian that lives in Seattle, but uh, I don't think he renewed his membership last year or this year. But and that's that's an excellent example of of of, of, of that group has uh, 380 people in it. We as an organization have half that. So you know there's a potential group that we could have as a part sharing experiences and and you know bringing us as an organization as a group together so that we can start having you know uh, a, a more community sense in, in, in what we do, because so much of what we do is individual, right? You know, we're, we're individually guiding and directing these, these groups, but we're all doing these shared experiences. So, you know, to be able to have this now, these tools, these online meetings and such, it's actually a really great way to bring the, uh, the other parts of the province and the region together as, as one, so that it is more of the CTGA of BC rather than, you know, kind of, you know, just by geography and necessity where it is um, uh, individually right now. So, uh, you know, the, us in, in the Vancouver area. So it's, it's a really great way if, if you guys have um, tourism connections in Vancouver Island, up north in, in Rupert, in those areas, uh, you know, uh, in the Kootenays, please bring them in, have them like our Facebook page, have them connect to our Instagram, have them like the, uh, the, the YouTube channel. Uh, we want them to become a members. We want them to share their experiences and we want to be able to network and connect with everybody. So, you know, the more, the more of a public face we have, the better for, for all of us. Exactly. Um, um, Charmaine, has Ray been able to go back to work at the Rosedale? Is the Rosedale reopened or did they shut during the... No, they were open throughout, Jeff. Uh, he was doing, I mean, the hotel was open and they had uh, some RCMP people and some of his other, um, you know, big clients that were still using the hotel. And he was doing two days a week uh, for a couple of months and then three days a week from last month and next week they're going back to full-time operations. So, I mean, in terms of the employees, but uh, hotel has been open throughout, yeah. They've had between 15 to 20 rooms or so, you know, sometimes a little bit less. Yeah, thanks. Okay, very good. And uh, I just see um, uh, somebody is, uh, uh, Karen Bradley is writing about uh, there's only about half a dozen videos on the area now, but uh, right uh, there's and not all of the uh, not all of the uh, CTGA Zoom meetings are there. I think Matthew's plan is to have them all there eventually. 
think that's the idea. Uh, Jeff, when we are back on the road again, uh, sharing experiences, you know, road closure and everything else, is this only your link where we can share or is this a new link coming up with that Matt is maybe going to put up? You know, you have a link where for the, for the YouTube channel maybe? on time experiences, you know, when parks are open or closing or road closures, whatever else. So people can get in and say, well, yeah, we cannot go through there tomorrow. Uh, you know, I, uh, um, I'll, let I'll let Matthew a answer that in just a moment, but I think sometimes, uh, you know, this, is, this whole thing that Matthew's been helping the board set up is new and we're all, we're all trying to get a grasp on uh, where should we look for information and so on. And at the moment, those Facebook pages, especially of the um, either my CTGA, Jeff's FYI, or the other groups that are not part of CTGA, those are the quickest way to, you, you know, you type a question uh, on that, on that, on those Facebook pages and within probably a minute, somebody's responding back. No, don't, op don't go that way. It's not open. Or yes, I was just there. It just opened. You know, so. And that, that's what I mean. You know, you set up, I think two years ago, your, your, your link so we can communicate on the road. So what's happening uh, on time, basically. One of the, uh, one of the, uh, I'm just going to play you guys a clip here if it'll work. One of the things that I found kind of fun over the years with uh, my iPhone is the uh, voice memos. Uh, sometimes you're with a passenger who uh, says something to you and you go, what? And, and you pick up a quote, some quote that's either their own or they're quoting from uh, somebody. And I'm just going to see if I can find uh, one where it's a little bit humorous here. Will I just scroll down a little further? Uh, let's see here. Oh, here, here's one here. See if this will play here. Well, Joe Bennett is live in our newsroom now with more on this. Oh, story. no, that's not the one. one. Wait a sec really here. Uh, oh, here's one here. Okay. Well, you know, in Alaska, there are 10 men to every one woman. And so women, the odds are good, but the goods are odd. This is from Karen from Iowa. <laughs> so that's, that's, the, uh, that's the kind of thing that's uh, cute, right? Uh, and I've recorded a few of those over the years, yeah. If I can find another one here. Just to quickly interject there for a second, um, just to answer the question, there are some things going on um, that we want to develop that would allow for a little more, you know, instantaneous chats and connections between everyone while on the road. Um, that's a longer term thing. Uh, right now, we're just really focused more on getting the skeleton for everything range, and then we'll go from there. Um, so um, that'll be that'll be a longer term thing. But you know, in a couple of months, once we've kind of established some, I guess not ground rules, but some of this, the framework for these things, and we'll go from there, so. Well, nothing, not much will happen this year anyway, but I think uh, for next year, otherwise we're just gonna use uh, Jeff's links there basically. Uh, to if and, 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 and for right now, as you said, that'll be exactly all we need to, to, yeah. to have for the moment. We're focused, we can focus more right now on, on building up, um, yeah. our community resources, you know, our, so that we can, you know, share histories, commentaries, ideas as an organization to help us all grow better. And then using, um, uh, you know, increasing those connections right now. Uh, so, Matthew, I, Matthew, we all just caught a still picture of you. You're, 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 you're sort of a, uh, so I, I, I was just wondering if you're okay. You look like you're being held hostage. Blink twice if you're okay. Uh, it's working all right for me right now, but I did just go down into the basements and I'm gonna be starting to drive soon. So I'm gonna be just listening over the radio in the vehicle. All right, well, here, here's, a, here's a cute little one from uh, 2014. A passenger told me, everyone turn your mics off just for a minute. Mute your mics. Make sure we hear this all right here. Today is, what day is it? Sunday, 7th of September, 2014. What was that lovely saying? What's your first name? Lorenzo. Lorenzo, where are you from? 
Switzerland. Ah, fantastic. Which part of Switzerland? Uh, Ticino, Italian speaking. Ah, very good. Yeah. All right. What was this lovely uh, pearl of wisdom? Pearl of wisdom? Oh, in paradise, the weather is beautiful, but in hell, the company is better. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, there's a good one. Okay. Here's, see if we get this one. Dogs have owners and cats have staff. Where, what's your name? Where are you visiting from? My name is Marilyn Arnold. I have a bit of a bad throat, but I'm visiting from Cincinnati, Ohio area. Fantastic. So dogs have that, owners and cats have staff. Dogs have owners and cats have what's staff. Where are you visiting from? So uh, these are the kind of fun things that I've picked up, uh, audio recordings over the years. But I can do that on video, right? And then submit a submit a 20 or 40 second video or something. So okay, let's see what's on the chat here. Something's there. Okay, someone say oh, thanks so, again. Yeah, go ahead. There's an excellent app that if you would like to download, it's available on Android and iOS. It's called Brain Toss, B R A I N T O S S. Basically, it you set it up by just entering your email address after you install it, and it gives you three different options, a note-taking option, a microphone, and uh, a camera option. And so if you have an idea or anything that's coming to you, you can very quickly just tap the voice record. It'll save a voice record, and then it will email it to you so that you can action with it later on. It'll just do that automatically for you. Any, uh, anybody else want to know anything else while you have uh, some of the uh, folks here who might know? All right, so Matthew, uh, did you want me to uh, talk to you uh, in a few minutes uh, so I can send you some more video or what, how do, what do we do? Uh, give, me, give, me a, give me a chat in an hour or two. Um, yeah. Uh, once I'm, the ones I can kind of there, and then we'll get uh, some more videos up. And I'll I'll go over and double check some of the settings on the uh, current Facebook group and make sure that we have uh, options for everyone to be able to see it proper. Um, I just have to check which settings they are. So. Yeah. Okay. And I'm uh, driving. I'm driving now. <laughs> okay. Okay, everybody. I guess we may as well just wrap it up. Uh, uh, no other quick questions or anything. And as always, you can send. Uh, myself or the board or Matthew an email. Oh, uh, it, it, it's a less intrusive way of trying to reach us and we'll get back to you when we can. If something's important or urgent, a uh, text or a phone call, I guess. Uh, but uh, uh, Ken, how's Anne doing? I see her in the background there. She's doing library work. <laughs> I'm, digitizing, I'm digitizing our photos. Oh, digitizing, okay. Uh, and uh, what's the mountain above your head, Anne? The mountain above our head is a place called Annapurna, which I think is in Nepal, and it's from one of our son's hiking trips. It's where? Nepal. Oh, Nepal. Nepal. Yeah. It's yeah. Annapurna is what it's called. That's where globe-trotting young people go to, you know, to see the Himalayas and that. Yeah, those, those young people with energy. <laughs> yeah. We do. We just want to, we want to walk a hundred yards and have a bench for five minutes. <laughs> okay. Hey Jeff, I'm leaving too. Well, thanks. And so next Tuesday, 1030, you say? Uh, no, next week will still be at 11. And then the following one will be on July the 7th. July 7th, we'll start at 1030. Okay. Move it up a little bit. It's a little bit blurry. Yeah. Okay. Next week is, uh, next week's the day before Canada Day. So. Okay, good. Okay. okay, thanks again. Thanks everyone. Nice to see you. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. Bye, thank you. <laughs>